Well, hello, my name is Gordon Palmer. I'm minister here at Claremont Parish Church in East Kilbride, and this is our service for Sunday the 6th of June. It has uh, been our practice for a long time at Claremont on the first Sunday in June to have a communion service. It's a communion service today. Of course, we can't gather in the one place. So please, if you wish to join us, have your bread or wine or alternatives with you for, for the service, and communion will be part of what we do a bit later on. It's the Lord's table, not ours, and we welcome all who love Jesus to share in this meal with us. In the letter to the Hebrews, the writer says that for the joy that was set before him, Jesus endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary or lose heart. Let us focus indeed on that Jesus who has done so much for us and who reigns on high. Jesus is King. Let us worship God. Let us pray, and we will gather up our prayers in the words of the Lord's Prayer. The form of the Lord's Prayer that we use, the words for that, will be on the screen. Let us pray. Living and loving God, we bring you our praise, our adoration, our worship. We have not able to gather together in one place. But we gather together in one Christ, one Savior, united by one Holy Spirit, part of your worldwide eternal family, sons and daughters of the living God. You're Lord of heaven and earth, Lord of space and time, of this world and of all the universe, Lord of life and Lord of death. We thank you for the gift of life, for the beauty of our world for the many, many points and things of interest, for the many kindnesses that we receive. And we thank you for the love of Jesus, the reaching out, the making time for, the making space for, the paying the price for, for us, so that even sinners like us can approach you. 
Living God, we praise you that there is so much that speaks of your love and purpose, so much in daily life and daily experience, so much in your Word, so much with, through your Spirit being with us, so much too in the fellowship of your family. And forgive us that sometimes we have lost sight of that great love. Forgive us for the times when we've made light of the gifts that you've given us. Forgive us worse when we've made light of the sacrifice of Jesus made for us. Forgive us when we've been slow to give thanks, slow to notice the touch of God in our lives. Forgive us for when we've been slow to hear your calling and slow to see and to take the opportunities to serve you. Have mercy on us. Cleanse us from sin, from all our weaknesses. And renew and feed us again from your word and from the gifts of bread and wine. So that with your help through the grace of Christ and in the power of the Spirit, we might be enabled to more faithfully follow Jesus. In whose words we pray. Our Father in heaven. morning. Our reading this morning is from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 to 6. It's entitled Present Weakness and Resurrection Life. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers, so they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. Amen. We have finished our season, James, and this morning I want to look at that passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 that uh, Leslie read to us early in the service. Um, in coming weeks, um, Martin Russell and John Collard and Stephen Preston will be preaching God's Word to us, and I'm grateful to them for their agreeing to do that. The first Sunday in June is a Sunday when we've been used to celebrating communion here at Claremont, and communion online is actually when I'm most keenly aware and miss the congregation being gathered. I'm more keenly aware not only of well, this is not how we used to be and used to do it, but more importantly, I, I'm more aware of this is not how it's supposed to be. Even as an excellent vaccination program continues, we're hearing calls to return to what we knew, what we had before. Calls not over, only or not even mainly about in churches getting back, but getting back to normal in all kinds of ways. For some people in the country, the um, easing of restrictions is too slow. For others, it's much too fast. And in that mix, there is church. There is the questions about what is ahead for us as a people, as a congregation. What will it look like when, as I hope and pray it will, we're able to gather on the other side of restrictions and a lot more of what congregations did is able to take place. Are we hoping simply to return to what was before? Or maybe some have got the taste for watching services at home, having your breakfast and sitting there in your pajamas as you look on. 
Just as people have responded differently to lockdown and restrictions, and just as people are responding differently to the, the rollback, saying it's too fast or it's too slow, we, we will respond differently when we're beyond these restrictions. And then there's the unknown about whether further waves of infection will come or new or different kinds of infection. The Indian variant might not be the, the last one. In fact, I've heard talk this week of one from Nepal. There's an uncertainty, an insecurity of a, of a kind that we have did not know previously. Things that we were sure of, things that we assumed, things that we took for granted, suddenly a lot less certain. And as we look ahead in all that mix about what church is or what we want church to be, what's essential to have and what we can do without. We have to consider these things and wonder if it's more than just a case of as you were and putting things back into place. There might even be questions about do we bother? Why do we bother? Do I really need church or faith or God? Or can we have faith God's favor on us without church, without gathering as once we did, without the meetings or the organizations that we used to know. Now, it's not at all new um, for the church to have to face those kind of questions. In fact, it's about 2,000 years old for the Christian church. And in 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul is facing those kind of questions within himself, not because of a pandemic, but because of all that he's been through in his experience as an apostle. He had suffered beatings, imprisonment, shipwreck, and much more, include being stabbed in the back by the summit Corinth, who he had led to faith in Jesus. And I think Paul must have wondered, why bother? Surely he must have asked himself at time, do I really need to go back? Do I really need to do this again? Is church that important? Is it worth it? But he affirms in verse 1 of that passage that Leslie read that he has not lo lost heart. How come? Well, we've not, he's not lost heart, he says, because the ministry has come, that he's been called to, has come through God's mercy. That is, it's the experience of having received the mercy of God that Paul's faithful service was rooted in. Here is his rock and foundation. Not that church or ministry seemed like a good thing to be involved in. Not that he enjoyed others' company. Not that he felt he needed this in his life. Not that he realized he was good at it and had something to give. Not these are any one of thousands of other things. Rather, it is through God's mercy he's doing what he does. And that's what calls the church into being, the mercy of God. And it's having a grasp of the mercy of God. That is to, to the church what blood is to the body. It is life-giving. It's what makes anything and everything else possible. And to be indifferent about whether or not we praise God, to be fitful in remembering to pray, to be casual in getting together to build up the body of Christ, to be unwilling to make sacrifices for the cause of Christ, to give only out of our surplus, to hold back encouragements for others, to not confess our sins, to not bear one another's burdens, to never mention Jesus to our non-Christian friends and family members, to be disinterested in God's mission in the world, all these and more are not because we've got good reason to let these things slip, not because we've got excuses, not because it's a matter of taste and preference. No, when these things are the case, it's because we are insensitive to the mercy of God. When the mercy of God does not mean much, then church is at best a pale imitation or at worst a complete sham. In Luke chapter 7, Verses 40 and following, Jesus told a parable, a parable which reached the conclusion, verse 47, when Jesus says, but whoever has been forgiven little loves little. And it's little awareness of being forgiven 
that is at the root of so much of our indifference, half-heartedness, and ineffectiveness as a church. When it comes to picking up the pieces after the pandemic, when we're allowed to gather again, when we can be with one another safely, it should not simply or even mainly be about seeing my pals or about having something that we enjoy that fills our timetable. It's about gathering to affirm how great is the mercy of God and to inspire and have us inspired and filled and, and driven by the challenge to say, let us be church because there is a great message. There is a great reality in the mercy of God. And we want to show and share and live that. So when discussions go on about maybe having different ways of doing things or new techniques or different services or this plan or that plan, we must remember and realize that important and relevant as some of these might be, without a keen sense of the mercy of God, it's pointless. And when it comes to participation in the body of Christ, the issue is not, can I be bothered? The issue is, how much does the mercy of God mean to me? The issue is not, does this suit my preference, my taste? Does it fit in with my timetable? But rather, does God's mercy mean much? Because when God's mercy does mean much, the issue is not putting on a program that appeals to me, that entertains, but that we fulfill the calling to be church, to love, to care, to serve, to, to encourage, to bear one another's burdens, and so on. So Paul says it's the mercy of God that gathers us, the mercy of God that motivates us. And if it's the mercy of God that motivates us, the, the message or the content of what we're doing is that declaration, verse 5, that Jesus is Lord. You see, it's not about us. We preach not ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord. It's not about making a wee bit of improvement here or there or bringing some relief or some insight, but rather it's a declaration to the world that Jesus is Lord. Now, for Paul to say Jesus is Lord in the world of the Roman Empire meant that Caesar wasn't Lord. It was a contentious thing to say. It was a challenging thing to say. And it's always a message that challenges and confronts the world as we find it. When we say Jesus is Lord, we are saying whatever else the world thinks and whatever else the world says and is depending on and having at its main priority, Jesus is different and calls us to a different way. And so when it comes to what will be possible again, what we might engage or re-engage in, it's not some option like, oh, wouldn't it be nice to have church like we can have a holiday overseas again or we can maybe go to the cinema or the theater again or so on. If we are truly gripped by receive, having received God's mercy, if we see the huge meaning and significance of saying Jesus is Lord, then the invitation and the call, the privilege and responsibility is to declare and make known that most wonderful news of all. But that declaration that Jesus is Lord is a declaration of where real power lies. The God who made light shine out of darkness in the story of creation, Genesis 1. The God who brought light that overcame darkness in Jesus, prophesied in Isaiah 9 and reflected on in John chapter 1. That God now can make his light shine in our hearts, verse 6. So someone coming to Christ Someone who recognizes that Jesus Lord does so despite the efforts of the God of this world, verse 4. And it's only because of an act of divine grace and sovereignty, just as much as creation was, just as much as the sending of the Messiah was. It's only because of the act of God that we then find him. And every time someone comes to faith in Christ, that's a further fulfillment of the Messiah prophecy. It's a further instance of God's life-giving creative power. And so we seek 
for that work, that movement of God among us as we declare Jesus as Lord and nowhere else is salvation found. But that declaration to say that Jesus is Lord had a corresponding impact, says Paul, in the second half of verse 5, declaring Jesus as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. One of the very striking things about Jesus' lordship is that he didn't come with a big army and try and force himself. That's how Caesar had got to be Caesar. That's how other rulers have done it. That's how big business in our world gets power, by manipulating, by doing uh, contracts that, that, that they can afford, that, that, that further oppress those that don't have. It's, it's power, it's influence. Jesus' lordship was not won through force or manipulation. He came to serve. And in Matthew 20, he told his disciples that while unbelievers lorded over one another, it was to be different with the people of God, just it had been very different for him. As he says, verse 28 of Matthew 20, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus is the one who did not jealously protect all his privileges and, and bonuses, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped, Philippians 2, but emptied himself and took the form of a servant and was obedient even, even to death on the cross. Jesus is the one who before the meal that we remember today as we share in the supper, who before that meal got down and washed the disciples' feet, we cannot declare Jesus. We cannot show Jesus without making ourselves and offering ourselves to be the servants of others. For the only Jesus that there is, the only Jesus who is Lord is the Jesus who emptied himself, the Jesus who came to serve rather than be served, the Jesus who stooped to wash feet. And it's the way of Jesus, the only way to follow Jesus is by serving others. And so again, when it comes to the thinking of any kind of resumption of church life, it should not be in the first instance what we are going to be able to do and have and enjoy. Rather, it should be the increased opportunities to serve others, to be a blessing to others, to help one another to serve in Jesus' name. Well, I mentioned earlier that people have been seeing things differently in terms of what this pandemic means, how we should behave, how we should come out of it, and so on. And another point of contention, of course, has been around vaccinations, about whether we should or shouldn't let people refuse them. And of course, some of the viewpoints, some of the arguments have come up with that, well, it's their choice line. You can't decide for someone else, it's their choice as if we were only to do what suits us, what appeals to us, as if we only have rights but not any responsibilities. And if there is good reason for someone to refuse the vaccine, then that, vaccine, then that certainly is not it. It's not about exercising personal freedom and choice. For life is not simply a matter of a string of personal choices and preferences. All of our choices, all of our decisions have impact on other people. And so while our society so often does approach things through this, the, it's your choice, it's up to you, do what you like, look after yourself, be good to yourself. It's not the way of Jesus. And one of the clearest indications that we have that the church has capitulated, given in to the spirit of the age. One of the clearest signs that that's happened rather than our being faithful to Jesus is when we repeat that kind of thinking and behaving in church. I'll do what I like. I'll volunteer if I feel like it. I'll play my part if I have nothing else to do. It's my choice. Commitment's an option. 
I'll only be involved if it suits, only if I'm getting something out of it. That's not the viewpoint. That's not the conversation servants have. Can you imagine the servants in a big house in the Roman Empire saying, well, who feels like working today? Who's going along? Who's going to turn up to serve breakfast today? Can you imagine them having those kind of conversations? Oh, well, I'll maybe do it today, but I'm going away for the next few days. Tell the boss I won't be around. Servants don't have that kind of conversation. And an awareness of the mercy of God, verse 1, leads us to that proclamation that Christ is Lord, verse 5. And that second half of verse 5 leads us to the conclusion that we are servants of others in Jesus' name. For the only way that we can make Jesus known is by being faithful to Jesus. And he is the one who stooped to serve. Well, I am sorry that today in a communion service we're not all gathered in one place. I'm afraid we can't do anything about that today. But if and when it comes to a time when we can do something about it, it's not enough to enjoy the togetherness. It's not enough to be maybe I, maybe no. For we must gather to affirm that without God's mercy we are nothing. We meet to get a fresh realization, a deeper grasp of what the mercy of God really is and what it means and does for us. We must gather to commit to the task of making known that Jesus is Lord, that the world's not got it right, the truth and the salvation's in Christ and Him alone. And that's why it's important for God's people to keep meaning together, to, to work out how do we serve in an alien world. And we must gather to pledge ourselves to be agents of God's mercy, channels of his mercy, to serve others in order to make Jesus known. And so the real issues for us are not about getting back to what we once had, not our return to normal. The church is called to follow to follow a God who is on the move, a God who is at work in the world, a God who is longing for his kingdom to flourish and grow. And the real issues are whether or not we get that, whether or not we are faithful citizens of that kingdom. It begins with a realization of how much we need the mercy of God and how much the mercy of God does for us and matters to us. It grows in the expression of Jesus being the Lord of life, not some religious pastime. And the realization that because he is Lord, we are servants seeking to bless the world around us, the communities that we are part of. And to do that not on our terms, but on Jesus' terms, and to do that not when it suits, but as first priority. For did Jesus not say, seek first the kingdom of God? Let us pray. Lord, despite all these kicks in the teeth and much worse that the Apostle Paul had taken, he continued to serve, continued to love, continued to be fruitful for you because the mercy of God was real in his life. Help us to grow more deeply into the awareness of how much you love, how merciful and good you are. And might that inspire us to live out your lordship and live out your lordship in a way that stoops to serve. In Jesus' name, amen. And so as we approach the Lord's table, a hymn that speaks of that, the way Jesus came and served and the call for us to serve. From heaven you came, help us be.
Welcome then to the table, which is the Lord's table, not the church's table. And we can only come to the table because of the mercy of God. We can only come and feast on the goodness of God because we recognize we do not deserve this, but that He in His grace has provided it for us. I shouldn't be here. Even <clears throat> if you're having this at home, you might say, yes, it's my house, it's my bread, my wine, or whatever it is you're using for the elements today. It's all mine, but that doesn't mean that we're entitled. That doesn't mean that we're uh, deserving. It's the grace of God and the communion that points to the body of Christ broken for us and the blood of Christ poured out for us makes that clear. Jesus, too, made that clear with his followers as he celebrated the Last Supper with them. And listen for these words in Luke's Gospel describing that meal that they had together. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfilment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Amen. Our God comes to us in grace, and we receive in faith. Let us confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. The words of the Creed will be on the screen. I believe. Let us pray. Lord, this meal, this gathering as family with you, the Father, reminds us of that free access that we have to you. Here is a God who welcomes. Here is a place where we can belong, a place where we can be secure because you love, and your love is freely held out. Your love is not something that we've won that we might lose again in the return match, but rather something freely given to us, given for us. Here we confess that indeed Jesus is Lord, that there is salvation in no one else, and that He is sufficient to bring us into your kingdom. We recall how Jesus, before that meal that we have just read about, that meal with his disciples, how he stooped and washed feet. This is our God. Such is the way of Jesus. Such is the Jesus that we receive in these gifts. And so such is the way that we promise and pledge ourselves to be. People who have received mercy, people who know that Jesus is Lord, and people who then are called to serve, to give, to stoop, to bless others. And so, Lord, as we share in these gifts, 
Right? Both we receive your eternal life and offer ourselves to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. And we recall how at that meal with his followers, the Lord Jesus took bread. And after he'd given thanks for it and blessed it, he broke it and said, this is my body. It's being broken for you. Do this remembering me. And later he took the cup, saying, this cup is a new covenant made in my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. When you drink it, drink it, remembering me. These then are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take and eat the body of Christ, which was broken for you. And the blood of Christ shed for the forgiveness of sins. Drink from it, remembering him. Scripture in 2 Corinthians says, for, the, for Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Gracious God, may that indeed be our reality our experience, that standing secure on the death of Christ and the rising of Christ for us, we go to serve, to live not for ourselves, but for Christ who died and rose for us. Amen. Now going to be um, led in our prayers for others by Tim Ward. Heavenly Father, you are the one who makes all things new. You bring us hope for the days ahead and pour out your spirit afresh upon us, granting to us life in all its fullness. May we be bound together by your life-giving spirit, recognizing in each other our shared faith in Jesus. By your creative power, may we grow in our faith trusting you to bring us to maturity in Christ, that day by day we would become more like him. Loving Father, every good gift comes from you. You shower upon us every kind of blessing, and in response may our giving be generous and be from an overflowing and thankful heart. We ask that our gifts of money that we bring will be used to bless others and be used to help those in need and so help usher in your kingdom. We come to you, Father, with our concerns and prayers for others, and as we do, we can all too often feel overwhelmed by the scale of need we see in the world around us. Often we don't know how to or where to begin. So we thank you, Lord, that in all things you go ahead of us, and as we follow and hear you speaking to our hearts, we find that you have been at work preparing the way. As we persevere in our praying, help us to simply lay our concerns before you, leaving them with you and trusting that you hear all of our petitions and that you will answer them. For many just now, uppermost in our thoughts is the hope and indeed expectation that the battle with COVID this past 18 months or so is over 
and the victory is won. We are so thankful for the huge collective effort from so many to do the right thing in keeping one another as safe as possible during this time. But although this may be the case here in this country, it is very much not the case that the battle is won in other parts of the world. Yet again, we see the pandemic highlighting the global inequalities that exist, where in this context, the rich have the vaccines first and the poor are at the end of the queue. So we specifically pray, Lord, now that the wealthier countries have been largely vaccinated, that the supply of the vaccines to the rest of the world will speedily increase. And so we pray for wisdom for all leaders in all countries that they understand fully that a global pandemic needs a global solution. Lord, it is difficult for us to comprehend the scale of the numbers of people who have died from COVID. And for many of us, we will directly know of relatives, friends and neighbours who have sadly lost their lives to this virus. So we pause for a moment to remember those who are grieving just now, for whatever reason. May they know your love surrounding them and upholding them at such a painful time. May your peace come. As the pandemic begins to recede, we pray that here and elsewhere, communities will reflect soberly on its various impacts, and so we all the more determined that as each country plans its recovery, that this will not simply be recovery to what came before, but instead be a plan to build back better towards a fairer and more just world in which to live. In the same way as churches too begin to think about returning to, to normality, we pray that they too will build back better by asking for and seeking your leading. Heavenly Father, by the Spirit you know and share in all our joys and in all our sorrows. Like Martha, we can be anxious and worried over many things. But like our sister Mary, may we take the time to sit at Jesus' feet and listen to him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And thanks again to Leslie for the reading and Tim for the prayer in our service and to Alison for doing the, the signing and to the folks who worked in the, the background getting all the um, technical bits and pieces together. Um, I'm going to be um, on holiday after this and um, <clears throat> I mentioned there'll be other folks taking the um, services in coming weeks. Also, if there are any pastoral needs, uh, you can contact Miriam Murphy directly or contact the church office. I've arranged the funeral cover, should there be any funerals, will be with uh, Terry Taylor, the Minister of East Kilbride South. Um, <clears throat> and the other matters will be, as I say, shared within the folks in the in Claremont. So, as I say, probably the, the office or, or Miriam is the, the best uh, route to go if you need to make um, something known, some, something we should be doing or some help that should be given. We conclude the service by singing the hymn that we learned, I think, just last year around about um, pandemic time, See Jesus Stripped of Majesty. And after that, we'll bless one another in the words of the grace. See Jesus Stripped of Majesty Disfigured on a tree A man of grief by men betrayed Like one from whom we turn away Led like a lamb without a sound In mockery with violence crowd A sacrificial